Hello and welcome back to Movies That Matter on Gooder's Front Room where we talk about the films that have really made an impact on people. Uh, this week I've been talking to Javier about The Big Lebowski. Um, so we'll cut straight to it and I'll let Javier uh, introduce himself. Hi, I'm Javier Gomez. I'm a writer and translator from Argentina who used to live in Manchester before the apocalypse started <laughs> then I got stuck in Argentina again while I was visiting and I write I I practice a lot of martial arts I do circus now and I'm that's basically my life <laughs> at the moment I'm always pursuing new interests now I'm starting to learn how to sing I'm a sort of a failed renaissance, renaissance man <laughs> I don't know and then are uh, you still doing, I think you were doing some comic book writing? Yeah, in the past I've done that. I'm, I'm writing mostly short stories now and some flash fiction as usual. But I've done comic book writing in the past and I worked in an indie comic book publisher. Yeah, today to talk about uh, The Big Lebowski, but we'll get on to that in a, a couple of minutes. So first of all, I just wanted to kind of ask you, like, what are your your film watching habits like do you what watch a lot of things and what kind of i guess what kind of genre of things do you normally go for if there's any particular well i i used to be like all the time watching films and series it's not so much like that now because i have too many interests so i have very little time but i still watch things i rewatch. i tend to rewatch a lot of things which is yeah. good and bad at the same time like I, I've watched Dead Poet Society like, I don't know, 10 times in five years. I used to watch a lot of movies at the end of the 90s and maybe like the early 2000s. And now it's like, I don't know if it's because everyone's into that, but you end up watching more series than films, Yeah, which is not good. But I still watch some movies once in a while. The last one I watched was uh, Rose Island. I think they, they translated it in English. It's uh, L'Isola delle Rose in Italian. It's, uh, it's, the, uh, it's based on a true story about a guy who makes his own island. It sounds weird, but it's so, so good. Mostly talk about the, the big Lebowski. Uh, so can you remember, like, how did you first encounter it? Like, how did you first discover it? I, I remember watching it not when it came out, but about like a year and a half or two years later, my brother started watching Cohen films. My brother is much more a of a film fan than, than I am. He, still, he does work in subtitles at the moment. All right, yeah. He's always watching films. And he, I, remember, I think he watched uh, Raising Arizona first. So he, he started to collect all the Cohen brothers movies. And we got to The Big Lebowski. And I, I always loved absurd and weird stories. Like yeah. if it has a bit of that element, I will watch it with interest. So, so I remember like actually renting the VHS somewhere and watching the movie with my, with my father and my brother. And it was, it was hilarious at the moment, but the, the underlying meanings like totally got lost on me at that yeah. time. I think I was 18 or 19, something like that. But then when I rewatched it, when they started showing it on, on TV, I was already doing martial arts and reading about Eastern philosophy. And so I, it kind of got a whole different meaning. Yeah. And then I started like finding new layers. I, I remember being like, I think it was after watching Sing City that I rewatched The Big Lebowski and I realized that, oh, this is kind of like a Ray Raymond Chandler thing, like a failed detective story. Yeah. But, but I didn't get that meaning the first time. So I think that's why I watch it and rewatch it once and again. It's like because it's a, a stupid and complex movie at the same time. <laughs> but and it had a big impact on how I I see things, how I perceive things. There's this is this is gonna sound ridiculous, but and I had this conversation with someone else in England, actually, in, in Brighton. There's two comedies, there are two comedies that influenced me and kind of changed my point of view about how I approach work and life and obligations. 
one of them is Big Lebowski and the other one is Clerks. And they are right. both like 90s stupid comedies, but yeah. they are really not. They are really not. They are like readings on how capitalism and society works, at least for me. Yeah, I mean, definitely. I think the, the Raymond Chandler kind of structure of it, I think is really a really kind of smart device. And it's not, like you say, it's not like immediately obvious when you start watching it, like particularly the first time, and then you kind of look back on it and you think, oh, hang on. Uh, yeah, and I think, be, yeah, yeah, but, but he's like the worst PI ever. Yeah, and like at, at the end, basically nothing actually has been resolved in terms of like the PI case, like everything else just kind of peters out because Lebowski's wife just comes back because she's just been away. Nobody actually gets any money. Yeah, yeah. It's like I, I read that in an article. I think it was it wasn't recent. It was like an old article about the movie. It's like everything ends up being just fake. The kidnapping, yeah. the the whole story is like no no nothing that you think is happening is actually happening. And this when I rewatched it, this line that Walter says, like John Goodman's character said, at some point in the movie, he says, it's all fake, dude. Yeah. It's like, he's kind of giving away that about like 28 <laughs> minutes into the movie. Like he, he's just giving you that. And you, you find like little like hints tell you that everything yeah. is fake and no, nothing's happening, but you have to be like looking for them. Then he has a lot of references to other Cohen films, but I, I didn't know that at the time. And I, I must admit that I haven't watched them all. There are still a few like missing yeah. elements for me about that. But it's, it's so, so complex and intertwined. And every character has, feels like it has a rich backstory. Some people say it's not the best Cohen Brothers film. I think it is. For me, at least it is. Like the dream sequences, the soundtrack, everything. Yeah so perfectly mixed and combined i would i mean for me it's certainly it's certainly up there i think it's a very close run thing for me between big lebowski uh fargo which is just genius uh and actually oh brother where art thou is just amazing as well well that, that's my second favorite i think and they are they are very similar in a way yeah i think it was the next film that they made Oh, brother, where are they? Yeah, I think so. And, yeah. and they are very similar in terms of, even in terms of like lighting and filters and colors. And they, they both have that like orange, yellowy kind of American South yeah. kind of thing. Or, oh. Well, the Big Lebowski can be perceived as a Western in, a, in some way. Like the stranger gives it that feeling yeah. of, of it being a Western. That I didn't realize that till yesterday when I rewatched the movies. <laughs> like when it starts with the, Tumbling, yeah, tumbling. This could be. This could also be seen as a western. Yeah. I think. I think my favorite comparison is the kind of the, the film noir like Raymond Chandler stories because like I think for me as well like the Raymond Chandler stories and the Big Lebowski they both almost have central characters that just kind of fall through the stories like Marlowe yeah, as much yeah. as like the dude doesn't is really just kind of pushed along by everybody else rather than like acting around them rather than them actually proactively doing anything. Yeah, it's a sort of like the plot is swallowing the character or something like that. Yeah. yeah. And the other character, like the thing with these movies, like the acting is so good that every character that you see is like, it, it's huge. Everything that they do is huge. Even that the loser PI that they hire to find Bunny Lebowski, yeah. he's so, so good with the, with the, B.W. Beatles. That guy is so good. Or uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman's Butler. Like, I think he has like two or three scenes, but it's, it's what he does is huge on screen. As well as John Goodman. Some people say it's like it's John Goodman, like most famous and most iconic character throughout his career is Walter Sobchak. And the way he, he alternates between anger and just like fake being chilled like he yeah. shouts at donnie then he talks to a dude and like oh relax okay like, shut the fuck up donnie and he's like coming back and forth between those those moods it's, it's brilliant brilliant how they how they do how they fit that into the into the script yeah and i think i was gonna like that whole dynamic between like dude uh walter and donnie is just just amazing and like 
I think Donnie gets a little bit underappreciated because like Steve Buscemi is brilliant as this kind of almost like the innocent is like this portrayal of innocence surrounded by anger and Walter and just kind of a you know the jaded kind of aspects of the yeah, yeah. times. Yeah, sometimes he comes out as jaded and sometimes he comes out as wise, but you don't know really why. It's just it's just because he's yeah. chill. Like all the time he's like just existing, not doing anything. Yeah. Which is basically the do not do of Taoism, which is called Wu Wei in Chinese. It's like you just go with the flow and let things happen and don't try to force any situation. And that's what the dude does. It's like, he's just going yeah. along with everything. And one thing I noticed that I found, like, I made that connection, and it's like, I don't know if they did it on purpose, but when he's like laying on the rug, listening to Venice Beach playoffs, which is just like, basically, basically the sound of the bowling ball yeah. being thrown, it's like, that's like a form of meditation for the character. So it's like, Bowling is his, his martial art, yeah, and I, and I find that brilliant. And he does a bit of tai chi at some point, like very weird fake tai chi with a drink in his hand. Yes, hands. yeah, it's a sort of tai chi. I think they kind of represent, or they kind of use the bowling, yeah, as the kind of thing that that centers centers yeah, every character. Yeah. Like every time, like something kind of quite dramatic has happened, they're always like they just go bowling afterwards because that's where they kind of find their their piece again. Yeah, that's like their martial arts, their temple. Yeah. Everything, everything's centered on bowling. Yeah, totally. And I can totally understand that because it's actually quite soothing. That like when he's listening to the tape, it's actually quite soothing. That sound of the kind of the ball and the, the kind of the ping of the hits and the. Yeah, he he's, like, he uses it. He uses it exactly like a martial art or a form of meditation. And then there's the Jesus character. John Turturro, with the, the, I think that the way they introduce it, they introduce him, I, I then, then again that's something I realized now rewatching it now. It's like this might be actually like a jab at organized religion, like mm-hmm. calling that character Jesus and making him the way he is. Yeah, and I think I noticed that as well when I was watching it um, the other day. An aspect I'm not really thought about because there's a there's a part where Walter is saying that he can't, he can't play the bowling game on the Saturday because that's yeah, yeah. Shabbat. Yeah, he's converted to uh, uh, Judaism, and then Jesus comes along and like he's saying, the Jesus does not care that it's your Sabbath day. We should. Play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah. He, suddenly, he suddenly had this thought of like, oh, is this like a religious like kind of jab thing? Like, th- th- there's this character Jesus saying like that's silly just to have like a a special day. <laughs> Yeah, and then they, they also play a bit with the with the current time when the where the movie is set, which is with the conflict between the US and Iraq. I think that's like not really shown, but it's shown in a way on how how Walter reacts to everything. It's like a metaphor for how governments sometimes react to those kind of situations. I think if you if you freeze for every frame in the Big Lebowski or even Oh Brother Where Art Thou, every frame is like a perfect picture. Like I, that's something else I noticed. I like I paused at some random moment. Like this could be a nice painting or a nice comic book panel. It's very characteristic of the Coen Brothers, but I think it, they it's perfectly done here. Even with the tumbleweed when it gets to the sea. Yeah, that that image is so so perfect. They are so so good at that. One of the examples that stands out for me on that is it's probably the dumbest joke in there, but it's when they're emptying out Donnie's ashes, uh, yeah, and the dude yeah, is they... the dude is standing just to the sort of side of water, and you can sort of see the wind blowing before he opens it. So you kind of know they've set it up, so you kind of know what exactly is going to happen, like any any moment. Yeah, that's one of the best moments in the movie. I think it, like Walter brings up like by being like his makes those moments funnier by being so unhinged all yeah. the time. Every time he comes into the scene, it's like oh he's going to blow something up or create some awkward situation or like when they are sitting down at that bar and he's shouting. Makes the dude character make he makes him 
look wiser by being Walter. Yes. He looks like he's a perfectly calm Zen monk when he, yeah, actually he's just stoner. That stoner quality really comes across in the way of how the, in the way the film is told because everything is like looser and yeah. going back and forth and you don't really, at some point, you don't really know exactly what's going on. It's like, is this actually a proper plot or we're just like following this guy around basically yeah. nothing other than smoking weed, playing bowling in, and just taking long baths? That's it. That's almost the way it's kind of built as well. It's like the, as we mentioned, like the kind of detective story doesn't really go anywhere, but then like, that's not the point. Like the point of that story almost is just to give us an excuse to follow the dude around for a bit. Like they've kind of put it in there just like, well, we need, we need an inverted commas, a plot to give us a reason to follow this character around. It's not relevant. Yeah. And it's like, it's like a window into his life. And at the beginning, the stranger said that sometimes there's a man, a man for, for his time and place. And maybe that's a sort of message of, about how you have to take your, how you have to approach society and yeah. the current situation by just abiding and being chill. I don't know if they wanted to create that, but that's how, that's what they generated. And that's why you have a do it festival in London. Yeah. And a Lebowski Fest in Kentucky. And it's like millions of people like go there, like travel around. There's, there's prices for who has traveled the most, like who came from yeah. the most remote place to that fest. And I can, I sometimes mock that, but I do have a replica of the big Lebowski's cardigan. <laughs> and I am a, an ordained Judaist priest, so I can minister in California and some other US states. So there is that. I can mock this religion, but I'm actually sort of a part of it, kind yeah. of a part of it. And I think, I think to be fair, that's how that religion works, isn't it? That's the kind of whole. Yeah, a bit like, like Pastafarians. Yeah, but the, the whole idea of like be be part of it if you want, but you know we're not that bothered. It's actually maybe it might be a religion that works that works well. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see in the future. Maybe it does do this temples all around as long as yeah as long as we don't get to the part where we have the terrible like dudism and pastafarian wars over who's yeah, religion is yeah. most pointless uh pastafarianism is so absurd and great too internet religions man well one of the things with this movie is like it became more popular after the internet exploded it's a it became a, a super cult movie i think it's it's that it's just the internet yeah. Because it wasn't so popular at the time and it wasn't so well reviewed. I, I believe it they they say it was great because of the acting, but the story went nowhere, no. which is exactly what the movie is about. A story that goes nowhere. It's a bit of a thing with nineties films and, and series as well. Like okay? in that sense it resembles Seinfeld. I remember mm -hmm. that it being called a series about nothing. And this is a bit like a movie about nothing. It's like there's yeah. no actual plot development or character development. No one learns anything. Yeah, nobody changes, nobody learns. He's just a dude and exists in his dude form. Maybe the only significant change is that Donnie dies. Yeah. That's the only, the only character change in the movie, someone who dies. But then everyone just starts... It's just the same when the movie ends. Yeah. No one be becomes wiser or wins something or gets the girl or gets the guy or whatever. And there's, yeah, there's just poor, poor Donnie who turns out to be sort of too sweet for the world, really, because he dies out of a, because of a heart attack rather than anything else because he's just, uh, I guess, so shocked or scared by the, uh, the nihilists who are interested. Yeah, yeah, and they also foreshadow that when they show, when they show that interaction with Smokey. And they say he has a heart condition. Yeah. I, I thought it's like, I, I don't remember if they say heart condition or something like that, but it's like you think if something happens, it will happen to Smokey. But no, it's just, yeah. just Donnie. And the nihilists are so, they are great. The way they dress, the way they talk, the things they do. One of them being flee from the red hot chili peppers. Every time I watch it as well, I'm always like, oh, it's flea. I think this philosophical thing that, 
got built around Lebowski, and I, it got built really by the fans. I don't, I don't think they intended for it to be so mystical between, like, quote unquote, because it's not a mystical film. But people perceive it as that, like, and they quote the movie, like quotes of wisdom. They do their bikes, and he's not, a, he's not doing anything, just buying half and half and drinking white Russians. Because uh, I think, um, from what I know about it, apparently a lot of the, well, the, the dude was actually based on somebody the Coen brothers had worked with, like a film producer that they knew. Yeah, both characters. Walter, too. I think it was John Millis or something like that. John Millis, who was like obsessed with the NRA and guns and yeah. owning guns and gun permits. But then, yeah, and I think it's really interesting. I was reading earlier on about, uh, or like, a, I guess, an essay who's, sort of describing uh, the dude as like a really interesting example of stoicism and that he's not, he's not stoic in a way that is the kind of common understanding of a stoic person, but he's stoic in that the fact that he just kind of, like we were saying, he just rolls along with things and nothing really phases him. Like occasionally he gets a bit, he gets a bit kind of thrown off things, particularly with like Walter, but then he's very quickly back into yeah, his kind of mindset and rolling yeah. along and, you know, as long yeah. as you give him a, a white a white Russian, he's fine. Like whatever is happening. Yeah, and they they end up destroying most of his possessions. Like they pee on his rug. They, there's a scene at the beginning of the movie where they crash the bowling ball against some door, and and it gets broken. And then they they break the bathroom's floor as well with the bowling ball, and they, they end up wrecking his car. Like it, it, there's that stoicism. Mm -hmm. That you said, that you mentioned it's like he's okay. never too riled up and i think uh, one of the examples often people cite for that one is uh, or that kind of thing is it's near the beginning when um like he's having his head pushed into the toilet and then they're asking him where's the money and he kind of takes yeah let me take another look let down me, there yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah this, so the, he's being I, rem I remember reading something about it being close to Taoism and Ep epicurean philosophy as well like living large and enjoying enjoying drinks and just generally laziness and living your best yeah. life of, of not doing nothing it's not like stoic in in, a, in the sense of like trying to get something out of it and, and being serious and righteous it's just like uh, this happened just let it roll they may not have intended I guess to kind of set out to put these philosophical messages in it but I think they definitely knew they were putting certain things in it because obviously we've got so many characters that are almost like polar opposites of each other. So you have like Dude and Walter, but then you've got like Bunny, who's the kind of trophy wife, the trophy married wife, the yeah. guy, gold digger. Uh, and then she's kind of contrasted with Maud, who's this kind of ultra feminist figure. Like there's a very deliberate like balancing there of those two. Yeah. And, and I also think that maybe they didn't intend to do this, but this, this was 1998 and it wasn't like in your face and everywhere like it is now but Walter can be seen as an as, as an exaggerated PTSD character yeah like maybe a bit of like they did a bit of satire with that but it, it can be a product of what of what he of what he experienced and he's all the time mentioning the Vietnam War and his yeah. friends and and the way he behaves and he owns guns and he dresses a bit like someone who was in the military would dress. Yeah, and you get it, I guess you get it again when they're um, going to dispose of Donnie's ashes and, and Walter starts giving like a speech and he kind of it starts out about being, talking about Donnie, but then he's quickly talking about yeah. like, all the people who died in Vietnam. And, it, oh, you know, they play it for laughs, but it is that kind of like, well, this is probably yeah a ptsd thing because like he's just connected death and then gone straight into like yeah and his obsessions uh, he's obsessed with shabbos he's obsessed with the dog he's obsessed with everything that's around him i think it, maybe you, it can be seen as a ptsd character in a very coen brothers kind of way because that's how they approach everything everything's absurd and over the top um, and you said you kind of you've picked up like different aspects from it, you know, the more times you've you've watched it. So yeah, what what 
is there anything in particular you think has kind of either bled from bled through from the film into into your life or sort of things in your life that have kind of made you see new things in the film as well yeah no it's like that the, the first thing you said like what stuff that bled through into my life it's how i approach things when whenever i i, I become i become too stressed with work and with the things that i have to do i try to take it easy actually mm -hmm. that that thing that they use in Judaism, take it easy and they do repeat that all the time. It's something that it's sometimes it's very hard to do, but I, I try to do it. I'm a freelancer. So I work from home, translating or writing or whatever. And sometimes you dig yourself into a hole, yeah. but then you just have to remember that thing. It's like, take it easy, abide, just exist and roll with it. And no one will die if you Yeah. send this file tomorrow but it it takes time it took me many many years to reach something that resembles a dude lebowski kind of mentality <laughs> and it's very easy to lose that it's in a way it's so similar to Taoism in that aspect too is that i remember reading the Tao Te king and and they say that that the way which is Tao. It's very hard to find and very easy to lose. And that philosophy of abiding and existing and going with the flow, yeah. has that too. You can, you can very easily forget that and just get tangled in your own problems. And it, you become this obsessed kind of Walter kind of character. Yeah. And yeah, that's what, what bled through from clerks as well, because it has a similar message. Maybe it's rougher. It's not so polished because it was Kevin Smith's first movie yeah but it has a similar kind of message yeah yeah because i think it's um it's randall isn't it is the main character in class yeah because yeah, he starts out being very kind of like overly stressed and then by the end of it he's kind of learned just to kind of like this is yeah. his existence it's better off just kind of going with it <laughs> but it, i think it's much clearer in the big lebowski and and it's obviously it's It's very well done because it's the Coen Brothers and everything from the movie, from the music to the scenes, to the lighting, to the editing, to the acting, everything is perfect. And something that I noticed today that I, had, I hadn't, because I was re-watching some scenes again today and I didn't have time to check. But I think the, the, the woman who, who's charging him in the supermarket, the woman who's working in the till, might be Skyla from Breaking Bad. I'm yeah. not sure. I'm, I'm not sure. I have to check that. Well, I, I, did, I, did, I did this with the Big Lebowski, with a lot of people, because as I love it, it's like, you should watch this. It's hilarious. It's a metaphor for many things. It's all this. It's all that. And, and a few people have told me it's not that great. It's just a comedy. It's not just a comedy. But for me, it's not just comedy. For a lot of people, it is. And I think it, it has, like, a special place in in everyone's hearts if you're from the 90s because it's a very like the aesthetics the music the music is actually seven, 60s and 70s yeah. but in a way it ties up with Tarantino's soundtracks from that same yeah. era and like it has that kind of 90s vibe yeah because I think one of the questions I was going to say was um, if you were trying to sell it to somebody who knew nothing about it you know what's your What's your line about why somebody who's never seen it? Well, I, I tried with the philosophical approach. <laughs> like, you should watch this. This looks like a comedy, but it's actually very profound. And it's a metaphor on how you approach di difficult situations in life. But it, it doesn't work. It ends up not working because not everyone gets that kind of chilled Zen Taoist yeah philosophy so I would just maybe next time I recommend it to someone I would just say it's a weird detective comedy with great acting and great music and you should you you'll find out what it's about like once you end we end up watching it once or twice and no one mentions that there's a, a great narrator which is a stranger it's a huge part of the movie I love that part when he they actually meet yeah well that's like kind of a bit like breaking the fourth wall yeah. in a way, in a way, because he's talking to, the, to, the, to us all the time, the stranger, and then he ends up 
talking to Lebowski. And then you end up thinking that maybe he's an unreliable narrator, the stranger. I thought about it a few times. Like, is this actually how it went or how he's telling us this? But that might be my writer mind. <laughs> Go, going wild and thinking whatever it wants to think. Yeah, I, I always I have that kind of moment with uh, uh, when they're having that dialogue and the, the stranger says, uh, well, I wish he wouldn't swear so much. And you, you kind of think, well, they, he's not really talked to him for that long. And then you think, oh, does he mean like because he's been observing? Yeah. As this yeah, yeah, yeah. like, godlike figure, like what's been happening? Yeah, that's what I was talk talking about. Like it, they talk for about two, three minutes. He doesn't swear that much. Yeah, yeah, you're right. It's the little touches like that, I think, that just mark out how smart it is, even though, like, on the surface, it's just this dumb kind of slacker comedy, I guess, with what people would call it. But there are so many smart things that are going on in the way it's been constructed. That's such a 90s adjective, slacker. Yeah. Yeah, they all, they label that kind of humour, yeah, yeah, that way. I remember, I remember finding, like, some similarities between Lebowski and Spaced, you know, the British series, it has that slacker, like, oh, let's not do anything, let's just smoke weed and hang yeah. around, kind of mentality. And it's also a very 90s thing, being a slacker and yeah. being perceived as unproductive all the time. I remember reading, what's that book, Generation X, yep. by Douglas Copeland. It captures that kind of feeling. And in, the movie does it in a weird way because actually he's not a young man. Jeff Lebowski, the dude, he's like yeah. well into his 40s. And one other thing that I thought yesterday, the first time you see him, he resembles either Jesus or a monk. Yes. With that robe and long hair and kind of disheveled appearance, like a mixture between Jesus, a Franciscan monk, and a Shaolin monk with the flip flops, and that might be that actually might be delivered. I think, yeah, in I, the way they they portray him. Yeah, I, I don't think that there's, there's much in the way that people are costumed that is is by accident. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything's thought out. Yep. I, I I remember reading that it helped the theater when they started like showing it. Yeah. For do these people, it held the theater for about six days. No, I saw, um, yeah, I was reading that earlier. There was one theatre who decided to put it on. It was like a midnight screen. Um, this was like a few years, obviously, after its like first run. Uh, and they were surprised, apparently, the first night they put it on, they had 700 people turn up. That's quite a turn up for an old movie. Yeah, turn, turn people, uh, loads of people away. Uh, so they just they kept it on. And I think it was actually, um, what I read is... Uh, they ran it for six weeks. It wasn't, it was weeks. Oh, I, I thought, yeah, it's six weeks, not six days. You're right. Which is a lot for an old movie. Um, do you have any, like, particular, like, really standout favourite parts? I mean, we've mentioned a couple of different scenes, but are there any particular bits? In... I really love the fight scene. I think the fight scene is hilarious. When, when they fight the nihilist, when they, they, when they he said, they, they finally killed my car. Yeah. That seems so. That seems so so good. And how he pretends that he's going to hit them with the ball, and then he hits them. But it's like everything is. It's like a slow motion fight. Yeah. They are very very bad fighters. All of them. I love action movies. And I love martial arts, obviously. And it's like the polar opposite of that. It's a very stupid fight scene. And I love the scene when they when they go to to Larry's house. To the kid's house. Oh, yeah. They, they believe he's a culprit. That scene is, I think, it's one of the best in the movie. Like, and it's, they play very well with silence in that scene. And ma in many scenes, they play really yeah. well with silence or with the opposite of that. Like when they are talking after they fail the delivery, when they, when they go to yeah. give them the money, which is not the money, and they, they keep the, the money in the car. And they are discussing at the bowling alley how they overlap, how Johnny yeah. Walter and the dude overlap while talking, and no one's really listening to what the other's saying. Yeah. I, think, I think that's brilliantly done. Brilliantly done. That's I think my favorite uh, kind of bit is like that is when they're 
they're at the like the dance recital for his landlord. Yeah, um, yeah, like, yeah. Like dude and Walter are kind of talking about their plan to go and see like this this boy whose homework they found. And like all all that Donnie really picks up from him in the conversation is it's near like an in and out burger or something. So he, he's like, Oh, if you're gonna well, go over there, like get some burgers. Yeah, or, or when he when they're talking about Lenin and he say he starts saying, I am the walrus. And that scene that I mentioned before is like he understands Lenin and not Lenin. <laughs> <laughs> uh that's that's also a nice Donnie moment. And that absurd play that the landlord puts on. On yeah. stage, that is so. They have those moments, like either some weird Shakespeare thing, like that, like the landlord's yeah. show, or when he comes into the other Lebowski's house, that everything is majestic and yeah. huge, and he's this like tormented figure behind his desk. Like they have those epic moments that I think they overplayed it very well in uh, *Old Other World Out. They really they they took that to eleven yeah. in that one, and I think um, I think they secretly love their kind of thirties and forties musicals as well because in in this film we get the kind of the bowling pin dream which is very much that kind of thing, and they have a very similar sequence in uh, Hail Caesar as well. They've just oh those that that dream sequences. I think it's it's probably the part that I re- watched and rewatched the most. And it's very, very like well tied to the rest of the film with the things you see in his dream. Yeah. Like actually how a dream would look. Yeah. Like, it feels like real dream, which pull, pulls things from everyday life into that. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it does totally. Because he have like obviously the bowling theme of it and like bowling is like his bowling is his only passion, as far as we know, apart from his rug. <laughs> And I like that bit near the start where he's kind of you have the um, the shoe rack that goes on forever, and then it pans down, and the guy sort of manning it is Saddam because Saddam, the, yeah, because he saw that he's in the yeah. new moment, so it looked like the subconsciousness just kind of ejected that in. Yeah, and how he picks up uh, Bush's sentence at the beginning: "This aggression will not stand." Then he reuses that. Yeah. Later in the movie, they do a lot of that as well. And I, I think you don't get those those details the first time you watch it. They play a lot with repetition. That scene with Donnie repeating, I am the walrus, I am the walrus. Mm-hmm. And then the Walters, shut the fuck up, Donnie. They they use a lot of repetition in a way that I don't know it's if anyone does that that well. Yeah, and there are lots of there are so many lines in it. Obviously now so many of them are now memes or kind of you know well there's there's one that I love that's that's yeah well that's like your opinion man I actually I tend to reply to a lot of trolls on yeah. the internet with that meme if I ever whenever I hear anybody saying oh that's just your opinion like that flashes through my head like just that <laughs> that image of the dude kind of reclining yeah. instantly goes to Lebowski yeah. and he's yeah he's reclining he's like being 100% dude and one of the things that I love is that when, when he says that, that, do not call me Lebowski, call me dude, or his dudeness, or El Duderino, uh, how they, they do it, how they introduce that reference there. It's like, for me, El Duderino, uh, well, that, may, that might not work for English speaking people, because it's like, it instantly takes me to the Godfather. Right, yeah. Which was El Padrino in Spanish. Yeah. So it takes me to that, but maybe it gets lost. So I, I never thought about it that way. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, but there might be some linguistic things that kind of play differently. Like, I always See, like... that's the that's translator's mind. I never made the connection because both languages, I, have, I sometimes think in Spanish and sometimes think in English, and it kind of blends in together. I mean, even that just, that's a really good line because it's kind of, it sets up this image of, of the dude, he's he is as the narrator says, the man for all people because he's kind of like he's giving all of these options, and then he's like, "Well, dude, Reno, if you're not into the breath of brevity thing, yeah, yeah, it's like yeah, he's chilled even with his own name. It's not even his own name. He's not Lebowski. I like that too. I like the I like how they play with identity and how Jeff Lebowski is like 
sort of obsessed with his name and his achievements. Yeah. And he wants everyone to know that he's Jeffrey Lebowski. And the dude does not care, does, doesn't even use his own name. And that's one of the things that uh, can slip by as well. I, do, I didn't notice it for, for so long, is that the, the big Lebowski of the title, like, as you say, is obsessed with his achievements and things. And then you find out towards the end, like the wealth isn't his, it was like his wife's because it's more- Yeah, than, he wants to, yeah. Like, yeah. He doesn't actually have any of his Everything's own. fake, again, everything's fake. Yeah. And it's like well, that's one of the things that took me so long to pick up on. Well, there's something really obvious that I, I didn't think until today, actually, and until yesterday when I rewatched it and started reading it again. And The Big Lebowski, and it's loosely based on The Big Sleep, and that, that's the title of the movie, The Big Lebowski, but I, it's just like, it slipped by, I don't know, I never thought of, of it. It's like, oh, yeah. yeah, they're giving you hints all the time. Because in like, because from memory as well, like in the big sleep, there's a huge like the middle third of the n novel just turns out to be completely irrelevant to everything else. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, I should read it in English. I remember reading it a long time ago in a probably lousy translation to Spanish. Because yeah. I'm guess, gonna do that. I'm gonna do that and find the parallels with the Big Lebowski. And it, I guess that that could sort of, you have that connection there of like the big sleep and the Big Lebowski, like the both have these huge things that seem to be critical plot elements, but just turn out to be completely pointless in the end. Yeah, like like the whole movie <laughs> yeah. in the end. And this, it has a bit of a, a gritty element as well on how they, they attack him in the beginning of the movie with the finger, the finger scene is so that It yeah. says so much without showing anything. So they're just eating at some diner and The, the nihilist woman is missing. She, yeah. She's missing a, a, a toe, and it's like they never showed it, but it it ends up being like a hard boiled, gritty, gory thing yeah. at the same time. And then, and then of course, when when Bunny sort of re-enters at the end, we get the shot down yeah. to her. We get the shot, shot yeah, the toes with the green toenail. Yeah, I don't think I know any other any other films that have kind of birthed so many kind of philosophical discussions and like a, a church, <laughs> essentially. Yeah, I, th I think, I don't know if it still exists, but I remember reading about the Jedi church that was in Brighton. And I never, when I was in Brighton, I was there for two weeks just for work and I never got around to finding the Jedi church, but maybe it's still there. Maybe, yeah. I mean- But I it's a different, there, there's a difference in how like Star Wars fans or Lord of the Rings fans or whatever fans approach those stories, philosophies, and how Buddhists approach this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's like everything's very tongue in cheek and like, like we don't care about it. Just yeah. Do or not do or do whatever you want. I think the only, the only other film I could think where people probably have, have written so much about like all the philo philosophies of it is. It's the Matrix, but like in the Matrix, it's so like in your face because characters literally sort of stand around and have like philosophical kind of speeches. Yeah, yeah. Whereas, Again, it's it's overplayed and exaggerated, and yeah, here it's like again the Taoist thing. It's like they they're saying something, but they're not really saying that, and it's much more profound than you think. That's how this film is Taoist, I think. Or maybe we're just overanalyzing a stupid <laughs> comedy. That's it. That's the whole point of it. But that's, I think that's the beauty of it, isn't it? it? You can sit and analyze it and think about all the different things in it and all the little details. Or you can just kind of sit back and watch, watch it as a silly, a silly comedy. Silly, yeah, like, an absurd story with, that goes nowhere. Yeah, with yeah. very, very, very good acting yeah. all around. Yeah. Last sort of thoughts on it you have? Any, any last words? Any last no, words? No, I, I, I would love for everyone to watch this movie, even if you think you're not going to like it. I think it, it, mm. it will surprise you. Like the philosophical Zen thing, or you just have a laugh. I think you're going to really enjoy it for what it is. It's just a, a, sto just a story that goes everywhere and nowhere at the same time.
uh, the, the only film that I know where so much happens but nothing happens. Yeah, like, and then, again, that's Taoism, like, like empty and full at the same time. It doesn't take itself too seriously in anything. Yeah. It's just a piece of, of a story, a larger story that starts in Los Angeles about a guy who doesn't care much about anything. I think it's just like one of those that the critics will never get at, like everyone praises Fargo, which is, it's really a great film. Yeah. Everyone loves Fargo. And, and maybe even the other ones, like after The Big Lebowski, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou, Burn After Reading, which is great as well. And it has a bit of that like, PI or detective yeah. kind of thing embedded in it. But this, this one for me is like the quintessential like detective comedy in a way. So many thanks to Javier for a great chat about a fantastic film. Uh, I'll, we'll be back again with another Movies That Matter soon. Uh, please do get in touch if you'd like to come on and talk about a film that is important to you. Uh, we'll see you soon.